listening part of Occupational English Test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Sadef Dogli. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Tell me, what's your problem? Well, I have a nine-year history of occasional palpitations. Symptoms occur three to four times per year, and they last for an hour or more, and my heart beats more rapidly, but I've never measured my heart rate. The most recent was yesterday. Uh, it's associated with feeling of darkness descending as if a shade was being pulled down in front of my vision. However, I, I don't lose consciousness. Yesterday, while working on a computer, I had a spell. Palpitations persisted for a short time. Okay, what's your age? 48, doctor. Do you smoke or drink alcohol or use caffeine? No, doctor. Is there any family history of congenital heart disease? No, doctor. You had any history of thoracic trauma or thyroid disease? No, doctor. I had anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, complicated by contact urticaria from a neoprene cast. Are you taking any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medication or substance? Yes, I am allergic to neoprene. As per your physical exam results, your pupils are reactive. Sclerite and nitric, mucous membranes are moist. Neck veins, not distended, no brutes. Lungs are clear. Cardiac exam is regular without murmurs, gallops, or rubs. Abdomen is soft without guarding, rebound masses, or brutes. Extremities well perfused, no edema, strong and symmetrical distal pulses. A D-dimmer was mildly elevated to 5. CT scan showed no evidence of pulmonary embolus. Moreover, there is no progression over the 9-year period that you have been symptomatic suggests that this is an unlikely cause. Two-dimensional echocardiogram shows no evidence of clinically significant structural or functional heart disease. A 12-lead electrocardiogram shows sinus rhythm with normal axis and intervals. No evidence of a pre-excitation. Lab reports show no evidence of myocardial injury. You have episodic palpitations and presyncope. I would suggest outpatient workup. Event recorders should be obtained and I will see you again upon completion of that study. I would prescribe suppressive medication, beta blocker or cardizum. There will be symptomatic improvement of the disease through it. Exam 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Dora Akem Akunili. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Hello. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Be seated. What's your problem? Well, I have uncontrolled blood pressure, Doctor. Very recently, I had a cesarean section delivery. Okay. What's your age? 36, Doctor. Do you have any chest pain or shortness of breath? No, Doctor, but I have fatigue. Yes, I get tired soon. You had uh, any previous illness or surgeries? I have the history of hypertension, gestational diabetes, mellitus. Do you smoke or drink? No, Doctor. Do you have any family history of coronary artery disease? No, Doctor. Okay. What medications are you taking? Cardizum and metaprolol were discontinued. Started on hydralazine 50 milligrams thrice a day and labetalol 200 milligrams twice a day. Hydrochlorothiazide and insulin supplementation. Are you allergic to any medications? No, doctor. Well, your physical examination report shows pulse of 86, blood pressure 175 over 86, afebrile, and respiratory rate 16 per minute. Neck veins are flat. Your echocardiogram shows sinus tachycardia and non-specific STT changes. Bun and creatine within normal limits. You have preeclampsia, status post-delivery with cesarean section with uncontrolled blood pressure, borderline gestational diabetes mellitus. I'm ordering echocardiogram for assessment of left ventricular function. I am prescribing labetalol and hydralazine to see the improvements, and based on the response to these medications, I will make further recommendations for your treatment. This is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For examples 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. For you will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a discussion between two doctors about the complications which are expected at a later stage following heart attack. Hello, doctor. What types of complications are expected at a later stage following a heart attack? Well, there are certain complications that arise at a later stage following heart attack. In the condition called aneurysm, a scar or tissue builds up on the damaged heart wall, resulting in blood clots, low blood pressure, and abnormal heart rhythms. In the condition called pericarditis, the lining of the heart becomes inflamed, causing serious chest pain. Angina occurs when there is not adequate oxygen to reach to the heart, causing chest pain. During congestive heart failure, the heart beats very weakly, leaving a person feeling exhausted and breathless. In the condition called edema, fluid accumulates in the legs and ankles, causing them to swell. Loss of erectile function is caused by a vascular problem. Loss of libido or loss of sexual drive happens, especially in the case of men. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about uterine fibroids. Hello, doctor. What are uterine fibroids? Well, uterine fibroids are benign tumors that may grow in various parts of the uterus of a woman. Intramural fibroids are the most common type of fibroid that appear within the muscular wall of the uterus. Intramural fibroids can grow larger and stretch the womb. Subserosal fibroids form on the outside of the uterus called the serosa 
and may grow large enough to make the womb appear bigger on one side. Submucosal fibroids bulge into the uterine cavity. Pendunculated fibroids are attached to the uterine wall by a stalk-like growth called a penduncle, which is the main difference between pendunculated fibroids and other fibroids. If a pendunculated fibroid forms in the middle muscle layer or myometrium of the uterus, then it is called pendunculated submucosal fibroid. And if it forms outside the uterus, it is called a pendunculated subserosal fibroid. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about acquired digital fibrocuritoma. Hello, doctor. What is acquired digital fibrocuritoma? Well, an acquired digital fibrokeratoma is a benign tumor usually occurring on the fingers and toes, which is an uncommon condition often seen in middle-aged people. Usually the tumors have a dome-shaped appearance, but can also look like elongated projections in some cases. Acquired digital fibrokeratoma lesions are usually isolated, but are also associated with other tumors in very rare cases. A type 1 acquired digital fibrocuritoma lesion is dome-shaped and has a dermal core that is made up of a thick, intertwined bundles of collagen, which are typically oriented along the lesion's vertical axis. There are numerous capillaries, thin elastic fibers, and fibroblasts between the bundles of collagen. The type 2 acquired digital fibrocuritoma lesions are less common. Although they appear similar to type 1 tumors, Histologically, they are typically tall and also have a considerably higher number of fibroblasts and fewer elastic fibers. A type 3 acquired digital fibrocuritoma is very rare, and the tumors are fluid-filled and have fewer elastic fibers. The lesions can be flat to dome-shaped. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about pelvic organ prolapse. Doctor, what is pelvic organ prolapse? Well, pelvic organ prolapse refers to the condition in which one or more of the pelvic organs suffers descent from their normal position in the pelvis. It may be congenital or acquired defect or weakness in the normal pelvic supporting structures. The anatomical categorization describes which organ is primarily involved in the descent. Urethra cell involves the anterior vaginal wall and urethra descend into the vaginal opening. Cystocell involves descent of the anterior vaginal wall and bladder. Cystourethra cell involves the prolapse of the bladder and urethra along the anterior vaginal wall. Uterovaginal prolapse involves the descent of the uterus, the cervix, and the vaginal vault. Enterocell prolapse of the posterior uppermost part of the vagina with loops of small intestine that have accumulated inside. Rectocell involves descent of the lower posterior wall of the vagina and the rectum which bulges into it. Question 29. You hear a discussion about hematuria. Hello, Doctor. What is hematuria? Well, hematuria is a health condition that is identified by the presence of blood in the urine. Microscopic and macroscopic are the two major classifications of hematuria. The different types of hematuria categorized based on the cause are Infective hematuria is caused due to pyelonephritis, cystitis, or urethritis. 
Stone's related hematuria is caused due to staghorn calculi, calcium stones, or uric acid stones. Trauma related hematuria is caused due to pelvic trauma, renal injuries, or foreign bodies. Renal hematuria is caused due to immunoglobulin A nephropathy, hereditary nephritis, medullary sponge kidney, or thin basement membrane diseases. Latrogenic hematuria is caused due to recent endoscopic procedure, transrectal ultrasound, traumatic catheterization, radiation, indwelling ureteric stents, renal biopsy, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Benign hematuria is caused due to strictures, renal masses, or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Malignant hematuria is caused due to prostate acinar adenocarcinoma, or renal cell, transitional cell, squamous cell, or urothelial cell carcinoma. Question 30. You hear a discussion about types of collagen and associated disorders. Doctor, can you explain different types of collagen and associated disorders? Well, there are about 29 genetically distinct collagens present in animal tissues. Collagen types 1, 2, 3, 5, and 11 self-assemble into D-periodic cross-striated fibrils. Here, the D is about 67 nanometers, and there is characteristic axial peridosity of collagen. Type 1 collagen is found throughout the body except in cartilaginous tissues. It is the main component of bone. It is also synthesized in response to injury and in fibrous nodules and fibrous diseases. Type 2 collagen is the main component of cartilage. It is also found in developing cornea and vitreous humor. These are formed from two or more collagens or copolymers rather than a single type of collagen. Type 3 collagen is found in the walls of arteries and other hollow organs and usually occurs in the same fibril with type 1 collagen. Type 4 forms the basis of cell basement membrane. Type 5 collagen and type 11 collagen are minor components of tissue and occurs fibrils with type 1 and type 2 collagen respectively. Type 5 forms cell surfaces hair, and placenta. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors about vovulvas. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello everybody. I am going to explain to you about volvulvus. The word volvulvus is derived from the Latin term. It is a subtype of abnormal gastrointestinal rotation. In volvulvus, a loop of intestines is twisted at a point along the mesentery, attached to the gastrointestinal tract. Volvulvus may result in bowel obstruction that is considered as a medical emergency. Because there is not a blockage, but there is also a compromised vascular supply to the gut. There are four primary mesenteries found within the abdomen, and as a result of it, there are four corresponding primary types of volvulvus, gastric, midgut, cecal, and sigmoid volvulvi. Gastric volvulvus occurs when our stomach twists at least 180 degrees around its mesentery, resulting in obstruction of the bowel. Patients with gastric volvulvus may be present with Borchardt's triad, which are spontaneous and severe epigastric pain, uncontrolled producing vomiting, noises without a vomit, due to the impossibility of passing a nasogastric tube through to the gut. There are two subcategories of gastric volvulvus. Organoaxial volvulvus tends to occur after traumatic events or hernia of the periesophageal area. The stomach rotates along its long axis that is along the path between the pylorus and the cardia. This condition is usually symptomatic when the rotation is more than 180 degrees and causes ischemia in addition to obstruction. Mesenteroaxial volvulvus tends to occur very frequently in children. The rotation of the stomach along its short axis, that is along the path perpendicular to organoaxial or the pathway between the lesser and greater curvatures of the stomach. The treatment of gastric volvulvus, which may involve an emergency laparotomy, insertion of gastronomy, percutaneous tube, and hernia and diaphragmatic damage repair. The surgery is primarily aimed to reduce the degree of twisting and prevent any chances of recurrence while taking care of factors that create a predisposition. Midgut volvulvus begins in newborn with sudden bilis vomiting. In addition, the abdomen becomes tender as it fills with fluid that accumulates within the bowel lumen and followed by inflammation of the peritoneum and shock. Patients with midgut volvulvus typically have a corkscrew sign visible on fluoroscopy contrast examination, which is a spiral appearance of the bowel. Another imaging technique, such as ultrasound and computed tomography, show a whirlpool sign, which is used to denote twisting of the bowel on itself. A LAD surgical procedure is done to treat midgut volvulvus, which entails dividing the tissue that creates an attachment between the cecum and the abdominal wall called LAD's bands, widening the mesentery of the small intestines, removal of the appendix and proper placing of the colon and cecum. Patients with sigmoidal volvulvus often have abdominal bloating, constipation, and nausea that may or may not be accompanied by vomiting. Sigmoidal volvulvus is considered to be associated with neurological pathologies such as multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. The causes of sigmoidal volvulvus include the South American Chaga disease, laxative use, and diets rich in fiber. A whirlpool sign is also seen in sigmoidal volvulvus on imaging. In addition, a coffee bean sign may be seen on the abdominal x-ray that will look like an inner tube that is bent. In most of the cases, the insertion of a rectal tube is found to be successful in treating sigmoidal volvulvus. Cecal volvuli are predominantly associated with two predisposing factors, lack of thorough peritoneal fixation and fulcrums such as abdominal masses or adhesions. Patients with cecal volvulvi tend to have distended abdomens in addition to colicky, abdominal pain, and vomiting. Nearly half of the patients with cecal volvulvi tend to have a cecum that is abnormally rotated in an axial plane, while the remainder have a cecum that inverts in addition to twisting. Treating cecal volvuli may involve laparotomy, hemicolectomy, or cecostomy. Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on refractive error. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hello, Doctor. What is refractive error and what are the types of refractive error? Well, a refractive disorder is an ocular condition caused by changes in the eye shape that prevents light from being focused sharply on the retina, creating vague images. The causes may range from congenital shortening or lengthening of the eyeball through variations in the shape of the cornea to anomalies of the lens. During the process of refraction, the light bends when passing through the cornea and the lens. This helps direct light from the objects we view exactly on the macula, the part of the retina that has the maximum number of cone cells, which are the photoreceptors responsible for detailed and sharp vision. Myopia, or short-sightedness, happens when the eye refracts light so much that the rays converge to a spot in the front of the retina, leading to a blurred image when one looks at objects that are beyond a certain distance. However, objects that are close can be seen clearly, as the light rays are divergent at their origin and so undergo the right amount of refraction. The eyeball in such people may be too long, or the cornea may be bulged more than usual, leading to the focusing of light before it reaches the retina. The condition is usually diagnosed in childhood between 8 and 12 years. It stabilizes in the years between 20 and 40 in most cases. A family history of myopia may predispose to the condition. It is correctable using prescription eyeglasses, contact lenses, or refractive surgery such as, carot such as keratoplasty. People with high myopia have a greater risk of future retinal detachment. Hypermetropia is also called long-sightedness that occurs when light rays reflect too little and so focus beyond the retina, leading to poor vision for near objects. However, light from more distant objects is parallel and so usually comes to a focus at the retina with this lower level of refraction. Some hyperopic people cannot see well regardless of the distance of the object. The eyeball may be shorter or the cornea flatter than usual, or the lens may have less refractive power than is normal. Like myopia, eyeglasses, contact lenses, or surgery may be recommended for correction. Astigmatism is a condition in which the shape of the cornea is uneven. For example, it may be curved more in one direction than the other, or show areas where different curvatures. As a result, light rays are scattered and come to focus at different spots on the retina rather than forming a single sharp image. This leads to blurry vision. Eyeglasses are usually recommended, but contact lenses to smooth the refractive surface and refractive surgery to chisel the cornea to a smooth contour may also work well. Presbyopia is a refractive error caused due to aging. As the lens inside the eye ages, it loses its power to change shape with the pull of the ciliary muscles in response to the need for greater or less refractive capability. As a result, it becomes less able to accommodate itself so as to focus light from nearby objects clearly. Near vision becomes a problem, leading to the characteristic picture of people over the age of 35 or 40 holding books farther away than usually in order to see them clearly. Eyeglasses are the best way to correct presbyopia. Bifocal glasses have two different refractive powers, with the lower part being designed for reading and the upper part designed for distant vision. This is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
This is the end of the listening test. Thank you.